It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Joe Soam to our program. Thanks for being here, Joe. We always start at the beginning with our artists, and you are embarking on an amazing adventure this year, but everyone will be surprised to learn that this is many years in the making, your Visions of America project. So help us understand the, the very beginnings, the humble beginnings of you as a photographer and how you came to you know, evolve into Visions of America, which is this amazing multimedia project. Tell us where you were born. Well, I was born in the, uh, what I like to say, the, uh, the belly button of America, <laughs> on the Mississippi River and uh, in St. Louis. And it's the city I always like to say that's the, uh, the most western city of the east, the most eastern city of the west, the most southern city of the north, and the most <laughs> northern city of the south. <laughs> Makes it truly the belly button. So, and I grew up in St. Louis and basically, actually tonight, I have spent precisely 50% of my life in St. Louis, Missouri, and 50% of my life in California as of today. Wow, amazing. Um, now, I understand that your love for photography was very, very uh, early. And in fact, you, uh, at age five, you wanted a camera and were clicking around and had the idea that uh, perhaps those seeds were being planted early on. So tell us a little bit about your childhood and, and the household you grew up in and your love for photography and how that sprang from a very early age. Well, I, I grew up loving anything with a button. And whether it was uh, anything that had electronics or moved up and down, was I was, I was drawn to. So uh, my father uh, actually um, introduced me to photography because he had, bizarrely, uh, a three-dimensional camera, which was 3D. <coughs> now, I know James Cameron likes to do a lot with uh, <laughs> Avatar and things like that, but I had a 3D still camera that my father gave me uh, early on in life. So the very first photographs I ever took were three-dimensional. And the best part about them were not the pictures necessarily, but you had to wear these little 3D glasses that we all now wear in movie theaters. And we would have parties, and, and, and the most fun part was everybody wearing their 3D glasses. <laughs> so when you were a child, your father, I understand, owned a appliance store. And so growing up in the Midwest and then him having an appliance store, you grew up loving all kinds of different gadgets. Well, it's uh, the, the image that we're looking at actually is a, a rare photograph, and it was either a, 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 an early look into seeing my name in light, so to say. <laughs> uh, and I grew up with my name in neon lights. It just wasn't exactly the way I wanted to see it. Uh, this, <laughs> But uh, my father had an appliance store, and a lot of people wouldn't even know what those are. But basically, you know, when there were record stores, they were records. When there were radios, they were radios. He sold it all. So we had records, we had radios, we had television, we had washers and dryers. They had buttons too, so I was into them too. <laughs> so, and I understand that this isn't the first time you saw your name in print. Um, I understand your grandfather was a bit of a snake oil uh, seller. Well, <laughs> Unfortunately, we will go there. Uh, technically, my name is Henry Joseph Soam, and my father's name is also Henry Joseph Soam. I always thought Henry, I got stuck with a bad first name, but his father's name was Henry Joseph Soam, too. Uh, so I'm technically Soam the third. And uh, uh, but the only thing that I know about my father's father was that he indeed had invented some. Um, unfortunately, some snake oil. <laughs> and, and one of the major claims turns out, apparently, obviously, was a curse, that it was a cure for baldness. <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately, my father went bald, and, and as we'll see a few pictures of me, I did have hair at one point, and I went bald at age 28. OK, so, but that's OK. You still look good. No problem. Well, I polished my bald spot. <laughs> Now, I understand you were a musician early on. You, you paralleled your love for photography with music. And we have some wonderful images of young Joe. And you still have that great smile. Well, but that, then I started using the, the snake oil stuff. And, <laughs> 
<laughs> but yes, uh, that's me in the 1970s playing with our band Maiden Voyage. And the only thing that really would connect me to the, to the Bergmans and here is that this band was the only band in St. Louis that did an entire 25-minute medley dedicated to Michelle Grand, and <laughs> including many Bergman songs. And uh, we got fired for that. And I remember, the, <laughs> I, re I remember the bar manager walking up to me and said, Joe, you know what your guy's problem are? You're good. He says, but you should be playing more of the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> Well, but those seeds were rooted in your love for music and love for great, great lyrics, um, you know, comes back. And, and we see this amazing collaboration now and all of these people that you admired early on in your rock and roll days. Well, there's two things interesting in this picture besides the early receding hairline. <laughs> and was that number one, always my best male friends were piano players. This was a gentleman named Gary Scott. And then more recently, it's Roger Kelway. And over my lifetime, two things happened. My taste outgrew my ability. So that's when I stopped being a bass player and started being a photographer. That was a quicker learn for me. But uh, um, piano players have always been a dominant influence in my life. And now I feel like I'm working with the best, with yeah. Roger Kelway. Well, and your love for audio visual, visual presentations uh, was very early. Well, then this is back to the button mentality. Uh, you know, I always had the theory that more is better. And uh, if three projectors was interesting, 12 projectors was better. And the best things about the multi-image shows of the 70s and 80s was not actually the show itself, but was before the showtime, they'd hit the reset button and all the little slide projectors would go backwards and they would make this incredible sound. This is actually myself setting the projectors before Jerry Brown's presidential campaign, which I was actually producing the show, then running behind the screen and just putting a wall of America behind him. Which is another passion for you is politics and your love for history. And we'll see this illustrated in your beautiful photographs in just a moment. But some of these early presentations, you've worked with some amazing people. Well, the interesting thing about this picture is William Shatner in California may be less of a big deal, but in St. Louis, when Star Trek was coming out, William Shatner was a huge deal. <laughs> and, and it was a very early lesson that, you know, everybody wanted to know, how, how did you get William Shatner to narrate your thing? And I said, well, I did something really incredible. I called him up. <laughs> so, so, and I couldn't Google him, but I got his phone number, and this is actually me meeting Bill, who was my first narrator, which was really a form, he had a great voice, he did a great voiceover, and, and to be honest, um, other than the furniture ads he did in St. Louis, which kind of degraded my value, <laughs> uh, he did a fantastic, I did three projects with Bill Shatner, and I'm very grateful. Well, to him. and you had a reputation at that point because you were doing stock photography and actually had a number of covers for Omni Magazine, and so these sci-fi images were respected and you know you had a love for science fiction. Well there yeah, one of the big influences on my life was not only the Beatles and politics and American history, but was also the man landing on the moon. And in St. Louis, the McDonald Planetarium Sym Symphony Director gave me the chance to produce a show uh, celebrating the Apollo moon landing. And in the process, I got to start to put together all these images. So the very first photographs I ever took were not the kind of pictures that you see of mine tonight of America, American cities, but they were these specific pictures. And the very first picture I ever licensed for a royalty, which I didn't even know what that was, I thought it was like jam or something, you know, <laughs> and uh, was to Omni Magazine. And so these are composites as I understand it, and you were doing duplicates in uh, a machine with lots of buttons. Pre-computer. Pre Pre-computer. So nowadays we would do this on, in Photoshop. So these are, are rather elaborate images and made up of multi-images. Yes, but I very quickly on that particular shot, that was a generic computer, and I very quickly adapted to stock photography. When, when, when the people that had the computer were gone, I pulled off the label. And then I had a generic computer, and then I sold it over and over and over. 
So describe your, your entry into stock photography and, and what that means to the layperson. Well, um, very fortunately, I encountered in New York City, my, my dominant photographic influences were all New York photographers, where New York was the capital of the photographic universe, and in still many ways is. But uh, the very first one was a gentleman named Larry Freed, and Larry Freed started the Image Bank. And the Image Bank is still a major uh, photo agency owned by Getty Images. Mm -hmm. But um, I saw one uh, story of a photographer in Washington, D.C. named Jim Pickerel. And it was simply a picture of Jim with a stack of slides, like in that picture. And he was dealing them like cards. It was New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Rome, Tel Aviv, Moscow. And I went, huh, that's a business model. So, so consequently, when I started taking pictures of America, I started shooting 18 identical pictures of the same thing. I'd keep the best one for me, and then I would do New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Tel Aviv. And then suddenly, within a couple of years, I was selling pictures all over the world, and it just amazed me. And it was important to get uh, a feel for what people wanted and what was sellable as well. And so you realized at one point you had to have every single major skyline and every you know, seminal moment um, that would allow you to sell these images over and over again at the various stock agencies. So you did quite well. I never comprehended fully what people wanted. I still don't. I never <laughs> took pictures of what I thought they wanted. I just took pictures that I wanted to take but I took them in the most um, commercial way. That particular picture that you're showing Los Angeles, I'm sure all of us have driven down the Harbor Freeway, but you have to walk across that bridge and you must get that palm tree in that shot. If you don't get the palm tree in the shot, it will not sell. So you started honing your skills though, and um, eventually you amassed quite a collection and how did Visions of America then evolved from your stock photography? Well, Visions of America evolved uh, in, as a title from uh, the, bicent the bicentennial of the United States Constitution. And being a history buff and American history teacher for a short period of time, uh, my love affair for American history continued. So. Um, my commitment to photographing America ult ultimately culminated with me encountering uh, two groups doing events for the bicentennial of the Constitution. One was my first major corporate client, Merrill Lynch, and the second one was the bicentennial of the U.S. Constitution in Philadelphia. So I premiered two separate shows at the same time. One was a touring multimedia show for Merrill Lynch, which was for Supreme Court justices. It was very well endowed. And the other one was the show I wanted to do with William Shatner narrating, and it was premiered in Philadelphia. And I always was gravitated to cities like Philadelphia and Boston because that's where obviously America emanated from, not St. Louis. So this, uh, this project for you have, has been going on for quite some time. At what point did you bring in Roger Calloway and the Bergmans? Well, it's not a question of bringing them in, it's a question of in, encountering them and then having extensive conversations about it. But uh, uh, Visions of America began as a singular vision, mm -hmm. and most of that singular vision was Joe and his RV, or Joe and his dumpy car driving around the 50 states, and Joe sleeping in a Motel 6. Sometimes Motel 6 was the best thing I could get. And so when I would go to bed at night, the, I didn't really think I'd be working with Alan and Marilyn Bergman, working with the Boston Pops, working with Roger Kelway, and having Clint Eastwood narrate my story. If I had done that, they would have thought I was a lunatic. So consequently, for about 25 years, I had to kind of put off how the vision expressed itself because, you know, I visual, I, I, I metaphorically consider every image I have as like a brick in a large brickyard. And before you can build the city, you need the bricks. So for the first 25 years, it was all about the photography. And then over the last eight to 10 years, I happened to move to Ojai, which Roger Kelway had moved there, and he and I had conversations, 
And he was just as kind of nutty as I was. And we both said, hey, let's do a multimedia symphony on America. I love America, too. And the goal of the project, tell everybody the goal. What do you hope to achieve with this project? Well, as a history um, teacher, um, my belief is that uh, the American idea, which is heavily rooted in our belief system of democracy, needs to be something that must be reminded from generation to generation. Now, what I'm saying is not necessarily profound, but it must be said by every generation because we have the greatest inheritance. This is the only nation ever conceived on an idea, not based upon geography, not based upon our boundaries. So consequently, the central thesis of my photographic work is to, like an artist, to find out what the subject is. And the subject for me is the question, how do you photograph the major idea that solidifies our civilization, the American civilization, and that idea is democracy. But the conundrum is, how do you photograph an idea? And to put it in artist terms, because I know there are a lot of artists mm -hmm. here, is democracy would be more metaphorically like negative space. You can define what's around it, but you can't say what it is. So consequently, for my purposes as a photographer, was to show how democracy manifested over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So consequently, what I photograph is really what my parents' generation and their parents' generation built. So 50 years from now, when somebody else is hopefully sitting on this stage mm -hmm. explaining how they photograph democracy, they'll be photographing what we built. Sure. So that's what my goal is through music, through images, and high-minded thoughts about what makes America special. Well, and there's a universality to this, uh, regardless of uh, anyone's political leanings. I mean, there is this beauty to this project that resonates with everyone in that you know, every wa everyone wants a beautiful environment in which to live, prosperity and peace. And so this project is so rousing in that it, it has this universality to it and makes you feel good and is reigniting patriotism in our country. I mean, really, when you look at these images, um, you can't help but be proud, which is something, you know, we've, we've had a little dip in our pride in our country, and it just seems like the timing is so perfect for this project to be launched um, with the Boston Pops, and it just, it just feels like the timing could not be better for, for the, the incarnation that it is now. Yeah, um, patriotism is more than a bumper sticker. And I think uh, you said a couple key words about it's time to feel good about America again. And it's not in a two dimensional way, but it's in a three dimensional way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have done the best uh, that I could, as has Roger and uh, uh, the Bergmans, I, I believe, and everybody involved with the project, is, um, you know, there is plenty of dividing the country now into this group and that group. And we all have our opinions and we all have our political uh, beliefs. But this stage and what we're creating, that's not the place to do it because what we need to be reminded of is what we share in common. Absolutely. And it's about bringing the American community together. And I feel like the best way to do that is through the arts, through music, and uplifting experiences. Absolutely. So you are not a stranger to politics. You have photographed everyone up uh, all the way since Ford, is that right? Well, no, uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Carter? Jimmy Carter was my first president I photographed, uh, all the way to Barack Obama. And some of these images are rather iconic. Uh, many people have seen these images before uh, because again, you're still sending out your stock photography through Corbis and Getty, is that right? Yes, and many other agents. So people have seen a well, lot of Well, and this, this image might be a good <laughs> stopping point. And you know, the, the most interesting thing about it is, uh, yes, it is a comb over. And uh, <laughs> I, I was, you know, and, and if you watched NBC News cover this, you would have seen 
um, my head up to here. They cropped my head off, but they had Donald Trump's, but I was right behind his, and I could see very clearly it was a very good comb over. And to be honest, if I had it, I would probably do it myself. <laughs> But, but th that back to that picture for one second, is that is a classic case for myself. You know, because I'm doing so much focus on the Boston Pops and what we're doing, I'm doing less of this right now and writing more emails. And, and, but I knew I needed, you know, you gotta bet on one horse or another and after tonight we'll know if, uh, if Governor Romney won or not. So I'm just betting, you know, that he's the guy I need because I don't want to photograph the number two or the number three guy. I've already done that. I only want the, their candidate. Who is that gonna be? That's who I'll get. So I drove 10 hours to get this shot, walked in, got it in four and a half minutes, got back in my car and drove back. That's dedication. Tell us about the book and publishing the book. Well, my photographs, to my knowledge, and it's an extrapolation, is I think I have been published 100 to 200,000 times in print. Wow. And however, those pictures have never been used in the way that I, the artist, wanted them to. So what I wanted to do in this book is this was my uh, uh, leap behind. So this book, to the best of my effort, which was born in the Great Recession, <laughs> it was not a great time to come out with a $100 book on the finest paper and the finest everything. But if you're gonna dedicate 25 to 30 years of your life, I did not want to compromise anything. So, so, and I'm honored to say, as a result of, of what's just happened, is that Reader's Digest has just picked up the book, and the second edition is, is coming out uh, in May and June, separate of the Boston Pops concerts, which is a great coincidence. And perfect timing. Perfect timing. And in fact, you have photographed all 50 states and all of it is represented in this new book. Um, and just like you taking the time to go photograph Trump and Romney, um, you made sure that it was absolutely up to date, this reprint, the second edition. Yeah, I, I added um, Michelle Obama. I added Kobe Bryant holding up the trophy. I even was betting on, just like I bet, uh, uh, on the New England Patriots winning, but I got Tom Brady for uh, his shot in the book, too. So these are examples of images in the book and beautiful examples that, uh, across the United States. You also photographed um, not just the beauty, but the sad aspects of our country as well, the darkness. Um, and you shared something quite beautiful about the dark side, you know, the poverty and so forth. Tell us a little bit about your feelings about photographing both the light and the dark. Well, I'm a big fan of Norman Rockwell, like everybody is. But I feel if you only show the good that it's only really a two-dimensional portrait. And I really felt that to have this meaningful that we need to see all sides of America because let's face it, everything isn't rosy. You know, and when some of these shots are coming up that, that uh, the image prior to that on the uh, homeless man in Beverly Hills, I got up and took a walk every morning and this guy was just laying on the street, you know, and they usually don't in Beverly Hills like people like that to be ambassadors, they usually send them to Santa Monica. Uh, <laughs> so I had happened to have my camera and so I laid down on the ground next to him and uh, got the photograph. But I, and I thought, you know, photography is really about juxtapositions. And, and the juxtaposition here is not the homeless guy, but he's in the shadows of the Beverly Hills Savings uh, Bank. And this particular shot was when I was shooting the Centennial, the Statue of Liberty. So everything was red, white, and blue. So here's this bench that says 1776 and the guy's sleeping on the bench. And the perfect family reunion shot. Yeah, but you, I walked by 500 houses to find that particular house with the entire family like that. So my shots are really more street photography than they are setups, per se. And that shot of the New York Yankees was the, the most wins in the history of baseball, mm -hmm. 114 games. Fantastic. So fast forward to your project. Um, Tell everybody where it is at this point and what is going to be expected from the Boston Pops. What are you guys gonna do? Well, we premiered originally in Philadelphia 
four days after the last presidential inaugural uh, with Peter Nero and the Philly Pops. And ironically, that gentleman on the screen, Roger Calloway, used to play with Peter 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the, the narrative in, in Philly was that Peter Nero and Roger had not seen each other in 45 years until this. And they had dueling grand pianos, and it was just a wonderful event. So when Alan and Marilyn Bergman attended, they really enjoyed what we did, and they heard more songs in a lot of Roger's instrumentals. So, and also some things that needed to be moved around. So at this point, we had kind of a, a threesome, so to say, uh, uh, with lyrics, um, music, and imagery, and script, because I wrote the script as well, and, and tried to um, uh, re-outline it for uh, vi Visions of America Point Two. And narrated by Clint Eastwood. Narrated by, uh, which uh, uh, Clint was uh, friendly with uh, uh, Roger Kelway because he did the arrangements for Invictus and knew him from other projects, as was he friendly, of course, with the Bergmans. So this is big news, and everyone's very excited about it. And because you guys have had one uh, shot with the symphony, you guys are going to be able to really have uh, an enormous response. And I know you guys are all working and on deadline and, and things are being tweaked and so forth. So as far as your participation at this point, are you still in part of the, the planning and the, the compositional aspect of it, still writing? And well, uh, all, all Mr. Eastwood's narration is written and recorded. Roger is doing the most of the work. Right. And when Roger is done, then I have to visualize it uh, Alan and Marilyn are already talking about a sixth song, and, and we're all saying yes. Yeah. So it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's really uh, Alan and Marilyn, Roger and I, learning how to walk down the street with our legs tied together. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully we won't trip. Yes. <laughs> and Patty Austin sang? Uh, that's a good friend of Alan and Marilyn Bergman, and uh, we were very honored to have her participation uh, in Philly, and in Boston, and potentially in Southern California, too. Very exciting. So we have this wonderful image of Keith Lockhart. And <laughs> That's a cutout that he probably would have preferred, didn't he? Uh, uh, we even understand Keith has been touched up in that a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> so little dings on that cutout. Well, how exciting. It's such an exciting project, and we are just thrilled for all of you, and uh, we wish you all the best. And we hope that it is a huge success, which we were sure it will be. So, gosh, thank you for sharing your time with us and being part of our program and allowing us to archive what you're doing. It's very exciting. Well, it's my honor because I think it's incumbent upon all of us to express and share our art for new generations, and that's what Focus on the Masters is about. Well, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you. but I think it's something that Joe should share with everybody. One time he showed me on his iPad how his book is interactive. And I thought it was amazing that, that you almost reinvented what a book is with having this on an iPad. And I thought you might want to, and I actually bought it. And I thought you might want to let <laughs> Oh, the it. iPad version. Yes. I only got one buck out of that. Uh, well, let's face it, we're in a renaissance in this new digital era, and there are many things being invented, like the iPad 3 now that we hear of. So I feel like as a producer and as a media uh, entity that I'm a bridge technology. I love the old media and I love the new media. So as soon as I did the tabletop book, I was going, how can I show this thing down in this little electronic uh, device? So my electronic version of the iPad version of the book has nine hours, uh, I mean one hour and nine videos on it and, and hundreds of links. So when I talk about Marquis Lafayette having a love affair for America, you just hit this and suddenly you'll know everything about Marquis Lafayette. That's fantastic. Fabulous. I'm old, but I'm still reasonably agile. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Um, I would like to know, do you still um, use black and white? And if you do, how do you decide when to use black and white and when to use color? What are the factors involved in that? Well, uh, sadly, I'm the wrong guy to ask. <laughs> I've, I'm a primary color guy. You know, anything you see of my work in black and white has been tweaked from color to black and white. So I did very little of that in my career, and I grew up shooting primarily E6 slide films, and Fuji, Velvia, Nakam Sakam primary colors. So uh, I wish I could be, it's a very artful medium, but you gotta choose what you're into. I mean, I'm like a hummingbird, I'm looking for red. <laughs> I just wanted to mention, I'm not sure, I know many of our friends here know what Joe and Roger's project is, but I thought maybe you should just explain exactly what you're doing with the Boston Pops. What is the format of the show? Okay, that's, this, that. that's a good question, Leslie, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> I, Visions of America is a photo symphony concert for America. It's 60 minutes, currently, of original music that is completely visually choreographed. Within that are five original songs by the Bergmans and Roger Kellaway. And the narration is all premised in the same premise of the book. How do I photograph democracy? That's what Clint Eastwood narrates. There's very minimal words. It's not a documentary experience. It's intended to be more of a visual musical experience because I feel that's where the heart is opened. So it's not intended to be a documentary. It's time for me to waken To fry myself some eggs and bacon Pull on a pair of jeans that know me well And boots that have a tale to tell A wandering day is what it feels like An open road is what my wheels like And where it takes me I don't know or care I only know I'm going there Across the railroad tracks and out of town I hit Route 66 with all my windows down I'm on my way to places that I've never seen before To me an open road's an open door I pass the old red barns, they've seen it all Weathered with her snows and felt the rains of fall. I feel the wind across my face and smell the summer day, the scent of apple trees and new mown hay. A river follows where I'm going with fields and meadows green and growing. I love not knowing what's around the bend, for every mile's another friend. I know the feeling that my wheels like, because it's just what freedom feels like. See to see from shore to shore and open roads and open door. It's what an open road is for.
Oh